Hello, my name is Hanson Oak, and I want to tell you my story. Each morning I'm home, which is as many mornings as I can manage, I walk up the driveway that is only used for walking to reach the gate at the far end. Without fail or exception, there will be letters and packages waiting for me there. It doesn't matter the day or the weather or the time, I'll find this correspondence waiting, which may seem like the strangest part of the story, but it's not. To understand the oddity in this, you have to understand that I'm a very private person, someone who enjoys and cherishes time spent in solitude, so the details of who I am and where I reside isn't common knowledge and it's not an answer you might find on the internet. So out of desperation or curiosity, people or the others who seek my attention simply write my name on an envelope or package and mail it out. Many times this is done even without postage being paid, and yet day after day, month after month, year after year, they arrive at my gate. One day I did ask the courier of a particular brown truck how it was he knew to deliver the packages to me, and he said simply, You're Hanson Oak. Who else would they be delivered to? And so this is how I know where to go or when I'm needed for this or that. But make no mistake, I'm not paid for what I do. The common misconception is that this is my job when it's not. It's simply who I am, the void in the world where I seem to fit. So then you might ask, well, Mr. Oak, how is it you earn a living if your living does not earn you anything? And to this I'll say that it began on the western end of North Carolina decades ago, where the land kisses the sea and the tides come and go when the moon whispers for it. I was about 10, a few years into my solitary journey in the world when I found myself in this place in search of food and shelter on what looked like a very stormy night coming. I wandered along the shoreline and came to a dock that reached out into the ocean, cutting a deep black line through the moon's bright rippled reflection. Now there's nothing inherently strange about a dock, it was where this dock was. It was not near a road or a path or a town or a city. It was near nothing but the high grass that I pushed through. At its end was a floating bit of amber light, a lantern dangling from the hand of a silhouette. So I moved back into the high grass, having made great strides and learning to become invisible in a world of curious eyes and people of various intent, but it was too late for that. You boy, stop hiding in that grass and come out into the light where I can see you. The gravel voice of the man stole my breath, and I did as he requested because I was young and compelled to the requests of adults. A silly evolutionary flaw to be sure, as children only have as much in common with adults as a caterpillar shares with a butterfly. How are your eyes? he asked. Do you have them? Both of them. Of course I did, and I told him as much. Again, a compulsion to tell the truth. He mumbled that this was good news, great news in fact, and I should come join him on the end of the dock. I did so, reluctantly. I was drawn to the darkness of his shadow, the light of his lantern, the mystery of the moment. He was an old man, skin wrinkled as leather soaked in seawater and left crumpled to dry by the sun. His clothes were ripped, old, caked stiff with mud and time, and his hair was matted and white. But it was his eyes, or lack of that made my heart bounce inside my chest like a hornet picking a fight with the walls of a bell jar. He asked me to use those eyes to look out to see if a ship was coming, and as I approached him I investigated the horizon and told him no. The only thing that was coming was the night and a very bad storm. It was cold and getting darker. The whispering winds from the storm were pulling at the hairs on the back of my neck and I was hungry, so hungry that I shook and ached from it. But if I'm honest, I was also terrified. A man with no eyes was standing in the dark on a dock that seemed so long that it touched the heart of the ocean, and I was lonely. I had been walking for days in the woods and marshes, avoiding people in cities and towns as I went, spending time only with the others in those places, and I longed to be with my own kind. So the man said, come up here with me, I'll need those eyes tonight. He wasn't asking, that much was clear from his tone, and then he said, Stand here with me and help me spot the ship that is looking for me. It went for supplies when a storm rolled in, not wanting to be at the mercy of the wharf. The rocks in this harbor are like grinding teeth in rough seas, but the storm is gone, and they'll be coming back for me. I looked out and see that not only had the storm not gone, but it was actually coming in. So I asked, you want me to stay the whole night and the next? 
and if I won't, I've drowned many pups who are no longer useful to me, he said. It was enough for me, companionship be damned. I turned to leave, but the dock was gone. I found I was standing on a rock in the middle of the sea no longer than I was tall. The shore was nothing but a thin line of darkness in the distance. Waves crashed around us. The sky was an open wound of cloud bleeding the universe of stars. I lost my balance in a panic. A wave pulling at my leg, but the man grabbed my arm with a grip that tested the socket of my shoulder, and he pulled me back up. Mind your step, boy. He let me go, told me to keep sharp, to watch for lanterns from the ship, to wave to them when I did, but all I saw was an eternity of darkness above a churning sea. The white crests of the waves looked like jagged teeth of eager, inky mouths. The moonlight glimmered and danced like flames behind wavy, fogged windows. He asked if I saw the ship yet, but I hadn't, and was far too scared to tell him so. You're not looking right. He shook me again. This time he took a knife from his pocket and pointed it at me. I cut my eyes from my head because they were distracting me from seeing what I need to see. Do you need me to help you do the same? I told him it wouldn't be necessary and that my eyes were fine. And you might think that I shouldn't have been as scared as I was. I should have known none of this was real. It was an illusion or something of the kind, but... You need to know that in my life, seeing the things that I've seen and being in the places that I've been, the line of illusion shifts constantly. It's never clear what side of reality that I'm on or whose reality I'm in. You're not looking right, said this again and again, twisting that knife and it caught the light and reflected in my eyes and just ignited my fear, so of course I wasn't looking right, I wasn't looking at anything but that knife and listening to his voice as he rambled on and on. And then before I can think to do anything about it, he grabbed my ankles and knocked me down. He lifted me into the air so that our faces were almost met. His deformed, empty eyes with the maggots and mud inside, the sockets looked right at me. He said if I wouldn't look right, he'd make me, and he dragged me off the rock as I clawed and screamed, and he dunked me under those churning waters. I fought and I wriggled, but his hands only tightened. My screams were reduced to nothing but bubbles passing over my face. I decided that if I was going to die, I would not do so with my eyes closed. I would see death come and I would greet it when it arrived. I opened my eyes to the darkness under the surface and I could see that what I thought was moonlight dancing on the water's face was actually the light of lanterns in its belly. They were attached to a ship, just like the man said, but... They were broken in pieces, laying among jagged stones. The swell of the ocean around it coaxed the corpses of the crew out. Their bloated bodies were still moving and tormented, trying to swim away from the doomed vessel, but they couldn't. They were bound to it as if by shackles or ropes. Then I watched it all slip away as I was pulled back to the surface. I coughed the water from my lungs and yelled, The ship! I saw it! held me higher, started dancing me around his toothless black hole of a grin in front of my face. Yes, where is it, boy, he said, pointed out to me on the horizon. And then I said, it's sunk. The ship, it's in pieces, and the crew are all dead. The grin left his face, and the strength left his hand, and he dropped me onto my head. Stars and flashes of light swirled in my vision, and when it finally returned fully, I found myself laying on the wood dock at the man's feet. His fists were balled in a rage born of sadness, and his old frame trembled. He towered over me, and I shielded my face from a beating that never came. Instead, I heard him begin to weep. When I finally got to my feet, I stood next to him silently as he mourned his hope. We both looked at the water as it prickled with moonlight, and I understood the nature of the man beside me, and I took his hand. You can go, boy, he said, but did not let go of my hand. He was not squeezing it hard, only tight enough to know that he wanted me to stay, so I did. His fingers switched, and his tears began to fall from his eyes like strings being pulled from a kneaded blanket, and he started to come undone. His face flowed like a melting candle. His flesh bubbled and popped as the air and insects forced themselves through. I felt their little legs crawl over me, but I didn't let go of him. I didn't want him to be alone. He'd been alone for so long already. 
then a flash, and his clothes sparked to ash, and I was alone. I stood at the end of the dock for a long time, trying to make sense of what just happened. The chorus of insects rose behind me in the tall grass, and as I turned to walk back towards them, something caught my eye. The reflection of the moon was different. The white sparkle had yellowed, and it seemed like a million fireflies underneath the waters. When I looked up to the moon, I saw that it was obscured by a thick wall of storm clouds. The twinkling I was seeing obviously wasn't coming from above, so it must have been coming from below. Maybe what I'd seen in my vision was real, and I raced down towards the end of the dock and jumped in. When the water settled from my violent entry, I can see the wreckage of the ship in front of me. The sparkling that I'd seen on the surface was the treasure in its belly. It was an absolutely unimaginable amount of wealth, especially to a boy who'd seen a slice of bread and a can of corn called a feast among five people, and now it was all mine. Once word got out, the state appointed an executor to my new fortune who established trust until I was old enough to tend to my own financial dealings. This man, Henry Fellows, took me in and guided me during my youth but did not squander my spirit on the nonsense of traditional schooling or saddle me under the weight of societal expectations. No, my dear friend Mr. Fellows saw in me what I would become and nurtured the connections I had with this world and the next. There are many stories to be told of growing up under the watchful eye of Mr. Fellows, but those will have to wait. In any event, with the noose of earning no longer around my neck and a guardian of sorts to help me along, I was free to be carried by the current of life to where it needed me to be, and it has since taken me to some very dark places.